and welcome to the Rediscovering Play podcast brought to you by Biba. I'm your host, Mike Rosen. As we've previously discussed, our mission at Biba and the goal of this podcast is to investigate, explore, and question what it means to play for kids in this modern era. Whether that's through building mobile games designed to get kids back out on playgrounds to get the physical activity that they need, or doing a deep dive into parenting tips in this new technological age, we are committed to rediscovering the idea of play for today's families. And what better time to be rediscovering play? While many of us are finding ourselves spending way more time inside and working from home these days, it's understandable that we might be trying to figure out how best to maintain a sense of normalcy and how to avoid going completely stir-crazy while cooped up indoors. This is especially true for parents who are dealing with the fact that their children are home, schools are closed, playdates and activities are limited, and on top of that, kids have questions about what's going on in the world and parents need to know how best to answer them appropriately. How do we maintain a sense of play in these trying times? How do we play with our children in a way that's both fun and safe? How do we maximize the limits of our confined spaces to make sure that our kids are still able to get the physical activity that they need? On this next series of episodes of Biba's Rediscovering Play podcast, we aim to answer these questions and more through conversations with parents, childcare workers, medical staff, and various other industry professionals to provide you with helpful tips and tricks, new perspectives, and fresh insights to help ensure that you and your family can stay happy, healthy, and active while we navigate this new current at-home situation. Join us while we rediscover play together. On today's episode of Biba's Rediscovering Play podcast, our guests are Dr. Zane Chagla and Dr. Catherine Clace. Dr. Chagla is a tutor in the Master of Science in Global Health program at McMaster University, a medical doctor specializing in internal medicine, tropical medicine, and infectious disease, and he is a consultant physician at St. Joseph's Hospital in Hamilton Health Sciences. He's an assistant professor of medicine at McMaster University and adjunct faculty at the University of Namibia and the Department of Medicine. Dr. Clace is an associate professor at McMaster University, a kidney doctor at St. Joseph's Healthcare Hamilton, and a member of the Center of Excellence in Protective Equipment and Materials at McMaster University. In this episode, Dr. Chagla and Dr. Clace talk to us about some of the health risks associated with going back to school and some of the best ways that you can keep yourself and your children safe during this back to school time. I hope you find this information useful and helpful for you and your family, and I hope you enjoy the episode. Here's Dr. Chagla and Dr. Clace. Hey, Catherine and Zane, thanks so much for joining me today. Thank you for oh, having us. Coming. Yeah, I'm really excited to have this conversation with, with you guys in particular, especially given the fact that I think that this is a pretty hot topic. I think it's something that people have been talking about for quite a while. And I think that in practice, we're seeing you know some of the positives and negatives of, of some of the prep and some of the fears that people may have had around kids going back to school and what the effects that that is having on the spread of COVID-19. So... Um, I know that you guys both come from sort of different sides of the medical field, so I'm excited for both of you guys to be able to weigh in a little bit, and I know that you've both spoken about this topic a little bit already, so why don't we get started with you, Zane, and just, because I know that you've you've talked about this topic a little bit, what are some of the, the sort of general things that you think people, parents, kids should be aware of and, and careful of, and, and what should they do to, to best protect themselves when, when going back to school to prevent the spread and prevent the infection? of COVID-19? So it's a, it's a very complex topic in the sense that uh, we've done so much in society to really mitigate uh, COVID-19 by distancing, by uh, some of the, the style controls about shutting down. And all of a sudden, we're now talking about putting a bunch of children in a classroom together, you know, doing almost the opposite of what we, we typically were doing with COVID. Um, and, and how to really protect their safety. And that's really balanced against uh, the obvious need that for psychological health, for educational status, for children to actually be in school and learning. And, and so, you know, these decisions were not taken lightly to put children back in school. And, and similarly, in other jurisdictions outside of North America, that these decisions were, were really trying to balance uh, children's health and mental well-being against, uh, against the, the community uh, issues of spread COVID-19. But the, the amount we've learned over the last little while, I think it applies very similar to that population. So this is a disease of indoor, close proximity, prolonged contact, 
mainly respiratory droplets. And so really the mitigation techniques are going to be along with that. So from the very beginning, when children come into school, they will need some form of screening just to make sure that COVID cases are not coming into school. When they are in school, they uh, need to be um, physically distanced as much as possible, uh, knowing that some of the facilities, you know, have have limitations on that, but using other uh, mechanisms, uh, using other spaces, using the outdoors to improve ventilation to really uh, work on that fact. Uh, you know, similarly, using masks uh, as appropriate uh, uh, to really prevent that transmission from student to student, trying to improve ventilation, but realistically knowing that, uh, you know, putting in a new HVAC system in a, a school is not a, a, a minimal undertaking uh, and trying to use the outdoors for part of it. Uh, and really keeping those cohorts very, very tight uh, and having students only interacting with a set number of students in the foreseeable situation that that children may show up with COVID-19 and the, the exposure risk is minimized in that sense. So, you know, I, I think there are some of these lessons that we've learned from other industries that we're applying to schools. But similarly, it's, it's, it's difficult to, to really um, apply these broadly in the context of a very unique population with very unique demands and very unique cognitive abilities. And, um, and that's part of the, the learning process through this. Mm-hmm. Well, I think that's, I mean, what, what it sounds like is, for better or for worse, we've had about six months of sort of figuring this thing out and figuring out what the best ways to keep ourselves safe are. And like you said, there is a set of best practices in terms of distance, in terms of mask wearing, all those kinds of things that would logically follow that those would be the best things to be able to try and keep the spread under control in a school environment. But like you mentioned, it is a pretty unique environment and a pretty unique population, you know, like the the X factor of, of kids being the one, especially, you know, there's been so many questions about are kids actually going to wear masks? How many masks should they bring? Are their masks going to get dirty? Is that going to change things? Are they going to do a good job of managing those? And, you know, I'm sure age comes into factor with that as well, depending on older versus younger kids. But it's an interesting question. And I know, Catherine, you've, you've done a little bit of research yourself as to the effectiveness of masks and types of masks and and what you think the best way to sort of make sure that kids are, are following that. Do you want to speak to that a little bit? Yes, thank you very much. The uh, work that we did was an evidence summary of the filtration properties of cloth and cloth masks. And what we identified were 25 studies that showed uh, that cloth does provide significant filtration, whether you study it as flat cloth or whether you're studying it as a mask. Um, I think it was accepted fairly early in the pandemic that cloth masks were going to prevent the spread of droplets out from the wearer. And there's strong evidence that a good cloth mask can do that and can uh, reduce the contamination of the environment by large particles, by coarse particles, by more than 90%, and by approaching 90% for uh, fine particles. But there are also studies that show that even cloth masks protect the wearer. And there's a body of evidence uh, suggesting that partial protection is better than no protection. So we are strongly recommending masks for um, for reducing transmission, for protecting a, an individual child so that that child doesn't get sick, first of all. Still important for children to stay well. Um, so that the child doesn't bring the disease home to their parents and to their grandparents, and so that the child isn't, uh, that the children in general are not drivers of transmission um, of COVID uh, as we go into the winter months. And that's probably very reassuring for a lot of parents, because I know even just from my own experiences, I'm sure everybody has felt is that in many cases, cloth masks can be more comfortable to wear, especially for longer periods of time. And there seems to be, you know, obviously depending on the mask and the design, less sort of user error than some of the medical masks in terms of the way that those things stay on. And, you know, you can be a little bit more flexible with design. And I'm sure for kids, things as simple as being excited about the the color or the design that might be on, on your cloth mask might be uh, an increasing motivating factor for a child to want to wear that and to understand why it's important to maintain that. That's essential. I think the key thing is trying to find a mask that they like um, and that fits and maybe, um, you know, just trying out different masks. And then once you've got um, one or a kind of mask that we that, you know, works for them, getting more like that. 
it's uh, really important for the children to feel that they have some kind of ownership here and also um, for the children to have some sense that this can be fun and stylish and um, and to buy into the whole idea of uh, wearing masks. Mm -hmm. I guess the other interesting thing with kids, like you said before, Zane, we know we know a lot more about the coronavirus now than we did earlier on, and we're still learning quite a bit. But I know that the conversations around the effects on kids and children's ability to spread the virus and, and all that, has there, there's been conflicting information. And I'm curious what the, the most up-to-date thoughts are on that and, and, and what people should be aware of in that respect. So this is this was an evolution. I think at the, the beginning of this, when the first uh, information was coming out from China, there were very few children as part of the data set um, and similarly in Italy, although that population was a significant amount older than, uh, than the populations that eventually the pandemic affected. In the context of this, all this data that came out, there's been a significant argument to say that children are not encompassed with that data as they are not getting particularly ill with COVID-19 other than a few that develop an inflammatory syndrome. Uh, and so there is a bias towards not necessarily testing children uh, as part of uh, uh, typical COVID-19 studies. The better data that's coming out, at least you know, for adolescent students, so that the high school student, is that they probably act fairly similar to adults. Their ability to transmit COVID-19 uh, is pretty similar to uh, adults' uh, ability to transmit COVID-19. And, and there's some South Korean data from contact tracing that really did show some of that, that 10 to 18 age group, although there are some inconsistencies in that data. Um, you know, the younger child group is a little bit more controversial. I think we all agree that that young children can certainly acquire COVID-19, um, that their symptom complex is probably much more minimal than the adult symptom complex. Uh, and their ability to transmit is certainly there, that they can give COVID-19 to people. It's just on a large scale, filling you know, a, a society filling filling classrooms up, what that impact is on society. Is it that children are highly efficient to actually spread it in a classroom or are children actually quite low efficiency? They can do it, but on a population level, it doesn't have much of an impact. Um, and so this is where where a lot of the questioning comes from and, and really what this experiment of getting children back to school with the precautions in mind to really figure out whether or not uh, on a population level, if that's going to ripple into community transmission or it's going to be single discrete events, possibly in schools, but possibly just relating to home environments and then translating into to the kids that are in school. So um, there's going to be a lot more coming out with this in the next couple of months as, as many more North American and Western schools get back up to steam. Uh, so, so hopefully that's a question that hopefully can be answered in the, in the coming future. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And like you mentioned, I mean, in, in so many ways, it does seem like a bit of an experiment. Like we don't know, there's a lot of different factors, as you mentioned before, that are pointing towards why it would be a good idea to have kids go back to school. And, you know, similarly, there's, there's a lot of reasons why it might not be such a good idea. You know, everything from economics to psychological impacts to medical impacts to all those sorts of things. But it does become sort of interesting when, you know, you think about, like we had mentioned before, all the different sort of best practices that people have started to to follow and, and, you know, obviously some communities better than others, but the idea of limiting your social bubble and all those kinds of things. And now there's there's way more increased exposure where, you know, before you may have been your family and another family or, you know, just a small group of people, but now you're exposed to the bubbles of, you know, all 20 to 30 other kids in that class, plus the teacher and then, you know, the teacher's families and, 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 and the way that it would sort of, you know, at least theoretically could could have huge impacts in terms of the way that that something like that could could have if it were to spread and get into a, to, into a community like that mm -hmm, exactly there's there's you know we we talked a lot about these concepts of, of social networks and bubbles uh, where where we try to minimize risk by people keeping people in a relatively close proximity and so this concept of schools where all these social networks and bubbles start expanding exponentially does create a complicating factor in the sense that if we do see transmission in schools and that transmission ripples back into the communities, 
then you know we are going to see a rise in cases, and theoretically, this may lead to a rise in vulnerable people acquiring COVID nineteen, which is exactly what we don't want. And so, you know, the school plan needs to be uh, uh, balanced against those risks, uh, but also very thoughtful and and very appropriate and very. Uh, early managed for public health exposures and risks in the school such that that transmission into the community doesn't occur to a high level. Mm -hmm. I think that with people going back to school, there's maybe a sense that um, that this is going to be uncontrolled, but actually it's going to be very carefully controlled. And it's also very important, I think, for all of us in society to realize that because we're doing this is not a reason that we can do other things. It's actually a reason for us to absolutely recommit to following all the public health advice that we have been following all along, to stick within our bubbles, to um, maintain um, as much of our um, contact with people out of doors, to do all those things that we've been doing all along as conscientiously as ever. I think that's a really good point. I think that the other thing that it brings about is a lot more sort of collaboration and crosstalk between different sort of industries or different sort of sorts of professionals to be able to figure out the best way to make all of this this work. I think, um, Zane, I remember reading, I think one of the interviews that you had done where you were talking about this specifically, right? Like educators are experts in figuring out, you know, how to educate kids, how to figure out lesson plans, how to do all those sorts of things, but aren't necessarily experts in things like disease control and having proper, you know, sort of management of those kinds of things. So it, it, it invites interest in conversation and collaboration between all these different groups to figure out the best sort of holistic solution, which ultimately, I mean, I think that collaboration is probably going to be a good thing because, you know, as, as has been discussed so many times, there's certain, certain things that people have started doing during this pandemic that are maybe things that people have should have been doing more beforehand things like hand washing or whatever it might be like those are those are good ideas to do in general and maybe people weren't doing them enough so you know there are there are positives that can come from this increased awareness absolutely and i, I think uh you know this isn't just a beginning of school factor you know it, it, this is going to be an ongoing discussion and an ongoing collaboration between all the uh, stakeholders involved in schools, but also public health and disease transmission within communities to start learning lessons and dealing with crises as they happen. Uh, and, you know, we, we, we definitely have had the, uh, the benefit of having some of our public health and infectious disease and uh, institutional leaders developing the plan on how to go back to school safely. Um, but again, you know, it's, 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 it's only a groundwork in terms of uh, 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 how to start, uh, how to respond is still going to be this, this multi-sectoral uh, uh, collaboration on how to, how to deal with crises as they come. Mm -hmm. And those, those learnings and, and, and the way that the situation is going to develop over time is, you know, it, it's going to be dynamic and it's not going to be the same way going forward just because, you know, I'm not sure how, how relevant this information may still be, but I remember early on, everybody was talking about, you know, the heat in the summer is probably going to be good for slowing things down. But once we go back into the fall and the weather starts getting colder, then there's, there's likely opportunities for the disease to spread more. And that coupled with the fact that, you know, like you mentioned in, in general and schools and everywhere else, you know, fresh air and outdoor space makes things that much easier. And if you're limited in terms of how outdoors you can be, because you might be in a colder climate or, you know, winter temperatures might be colder and you can't have windows open or you can't do classes outside, presumably th this situation is going to be ever changing and is going to require continued collaboration and continued talk to be able to sort of adapt and change that plan as it moves along. Exactly. And I think this isn't, this is, you know, local and regional authorities, but it's also, as we mentioned earlier, it's going to be the learnings from other places in, in other, uh, uh, other parts uh, around the world. And, and so we're going to be learning lessons from what's happening in Denmark and the Netherlands and, and England, as well as they're going to be learning lessons from us in terms of what worked and what didn't work. And that um, plan just really needs to be recalibrated as, as things move on. And it's a good transition for talking about how things seem to be working so far. Like you mentioned, there's a few places that are a few countries and, and, and a few different cities that have started to have kids go back to school and there's kind of been from what at least what i've seen mixed results have you guys been following what's been going on at all 
I was reading about our local Hamilton experience with day camps. Now it's a much uh, smaller setting and it's perhaps um, easier to control, but there weren't any cases actually in Hamilton day camps over the summer. So that gives me some cautious optimism. Um, I leave it to Zane though to talk about the uh, what's happening um, more widely and what's happening with school openings. Yeah, so there's there's definitely been different trends, and and I think one of the big lessons learned, and, and we had mentioned this earlier, is is what's going on in the community really does affect what happens in schools, and and so uh, places where community transmission has been relatively low and controlled, and testing has been adequate, and people are screening appropriately. Um, they've had some relative success in, in opening up schools in Southeast Asia and, and uh, in some countries in Europe. But similarly, where we've seen uh, relatively uncontrolled transmission, knowing that the disease doesn't stop at the four doors of the school, uh, you know, the same thing happens in the sense that uh, the disease comes into the schools and transmits in the schools because the burden is just there. So uh, great examples in Israel great examples in some place in the United States, like Georgia. Uh, lessons learned from that standpoint. Uh, I'll, I'll cite one example I think is, is, uh, is really uh, getting some interesting press is, is in Germany where distancing hasn't been as, as adequate as I think we would all like. Masks have been worn in schools, not necessarily um, uh, in the common areas. And, uh, and they certainly have had cases uh, but thankfully, I think in their experience of, of 4,000 or so schools, they've had about 80 cases, but there hasn't been much transmission within the four doors of the school. So, you know, some would see that as a failure, whereas, you know, those are expected cases that unfortunately, because students are a part of the community as much as everyone else, may bring COVID into schools. But the, to the sake of it, their, their controls seem to be working. They're doing relatively good surveillance. Their testing capacity is probably better than many countries uh, in the world. Um, and they haven't really seen a ton of that transmission. So, um, you know, I, I think it's a really good example of, you know, a pragmatic model where they just took what they could take in terms of the infrastructure, the space. They applied the tools that they could apply, knowing that they couldn't necessarily get to the most optimal environment but made sure their public health responses and testing were robust to make sure that, you know, in the events that things do happen, that, uh, that the transmission is really halted uh, in school. So uh, there are certainly positive examples that are showing up in the literature here and there. Mm -hmm. sure. Well, it's really reassuring to hear again. And, and it sort of makes sense, right? There's different levels of diligence from one country to another and one institution to another and from one school to another, I would imagine, because it just goes to show that for every case, I think yesterday I was just reading that in Alberta, they had just opened schools last week and already 22 schools have reported that they've had outbreaks or something along those lines. It, it's good to know that for, for, for as many stories as there are of those things, there's also large scale successes like you're talking about in, in Germany. But I guess the, the, the question is for parents who have kids in schools where, for instance, in Alberta, where there might be an outbreak like that, do you think that, that the immediate action from those parents who are there is to pull their kids out of the schools? Do you think that there's things that the schools can be doing to make sure that those, thing, those, those outbreaks don't spread? I think we have to realize that uh, we have to be responsive to the individual circumstances. And as Zane said, everything um, depends on what community transmission is like and what um, is happening and what the actual outbreak is like. So I think what, what that means is that we all have to realize that pu local public health policy has to be very responsive and that that means that it will be in flux um and and bear with that and bear with each other so we have to understand that some parents will be uh, very worried if something like that happens and may consider withdrawing their children from in-person classes um, whereas others will be comfortable going with public health policy and doing whatever it is is recommended as a response to that particular outbreak Right. And I guess further to that is sort of the individual circumstances of those families. You know, if there's somebody who's immunocompromised, then they might be a little bit more careful or a, a little more risk averse than somebody else. So like you said, the sort of individual circumstances on a micro level, and then as the ways those sort of trickle up, I think are, like you said, the best way to sort of manage um, decision making on, on uh, when it comes to these kinds of things.
Yeah, that's that's exactly right. And then, you know, if you have some um, older people in your bubble that you're concerned about, you can consider um, not seeing them if you are particularly concerned about what's happening in school, um, in your, your own child's school at that time. Um, you can consider um, unbubbling with them for a few weeks while you um, wait and see what happens with the children returning to school. I think every individual family is going to think about their own family members, who's in their bubble with them, what their risk is, and and make a good decision for themselves. Totally. And I think that the the important thing, like we've sort of mentioned a few times, is that, you know, I think everybody has good intentions around these things. Nobody's trying to hurt anybody else. Everybody wants to keep themselves and their communities safe and being mindful of those things and also being productive and proactive with the kinds of conversations and decisions that are being made. And obviously, you know, for, for many people, um, anxieties are running high around these things and fear are running high for all these different reasons, but recognizing that nobody's trying to be punitive with any of these these sort of policies or any of the things that are moving forward. We're all trying to figure this out in the most productive way as possible. And I think for everybody to remember that and to be as, as sort of positive and, and proactive and, and like I said, as, as productive as possible in those conversations as opposed to getting defensive or aggressive or whatever it means. And I think that's going to be the key to that collaboration that we've talked about in terms of coming up with a good short-term and long-term solution for managing this and also returning to a, a, at least a semblance of, of normal as soon as possible. Yes, absolutely. Did you have any other final thoughts, either of you guys, about you know the, the the ways that schools are handling these or should be handling these or that the way that parents are, are sort of reacting or any anything that you think people should keep in mind to make sure that they're keeping themselves and their families safe i mean i think one thing and and then and, and and going with the theme of kindness but but also the theme of uh, um global responsibility is the the way we used to act i think uh of um you know, showing up to work a little bit sick or going to school a little bit sick or, you know, uh, bearing and grinning through, uh, you know, uh, trying not to be absent from work to take care of a child and, and that type of thing. As much as that that sufficed in the years prior, it is not going to suffice this year. Um, and, and really parents need to be very, very careful about screening their children for symptoms about understanding when the need of their jurisdiction is to point them to get tested and there is some variation from jurisdiction to jurisdiction uh, and keeping their kids out while they're symptomatic, at least until they recover, even if it's not a COVID uh, related illness. Um, uh, it's, it's, it's very, very important this year uh, as part of that. And, and for, for parents and employers, similarly, that there is going to be a significant amount of absenteeism related to uh, children getting the typical illnesses that they get, even if they're not COVID, um, but having to to be at home and and uh, and isolate uh, at home until those symptoms resolve, and and so that's going to be a bit of a, a painful process going into the year, and and for everyone, it's just a. Uh, another reason to just be kind and to be uh, appropriate to others, understanding that this is a situation where we don't want sick people entering into society until their symptoms resolve. Yeah, definitely a better safe than sorry approach is probably best. And like you said, you know, it might be short term complications associated with that. But if ultimately those short term complications lead to a shortening uh, or, or at least a, a flattening of the curve, as it were, of the spread, then those sort of short term sacrifices or short term challenges are, are definitely worthwhile uh, trade offs. I think that's what I would uh, like to add to uh, Zane's very good advice. This is absolutely worth doing. It's the well-being of our children, the education of our children is an important goal for most of us and an important societal goal. So, so it's worth doing and it's worth doing well and it's being done very carefully um, and with monitoring. And I think, as I say, it's a, it's a time for us to recommit to all the other uh, changes that we've made in, uh, in terms of our personal lives to try and um, break the chain and reduce transmission. The other thing I want to say is just to mention the teachers in all this. You know, Zane and I, we went to medical school and, you know, from um, our earliest training, we knew that we would uh, sometimes have to put ourselves at personal risk to um, look after patients. 
and uh, teachers are now being asked to not not assume the same risks as someone who cares for a patient with COVID, but they are being asked to uh, be exposed to um, small cohorts of children um, every day. And so I just want to say how grateful I am to the teachers for being prepared to do this and how important they are to society and how important it is that we all do everything we can to protect them in terms of, um, in terms of the strategies that they will use, like wearing masks and eye protection, um, but also the strategies that we can use, which like Zane says, means um, keeping children home when they're even slightly unwell. Yeah, I think that's a great point and a super important thing to remember, like you mentioned, you know, there, there, there are a lot of different groups of people who are affected by these. And there's a lot of people who are, I think, being honorable and, and brave and are doing important work for, for a lot of different reasons. And like you said, putting themselves at risk. And that's true of, you know, frontline medical workers. That's true of, of teachers. It's true of a bunch of different groups. And I think that acknowledging that and being mindful of that and then doing everything that we can on our side to make sure that we're keeping those people and safe and, and in situations that are safe is 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 the best way forward for sure. Well, I, I really, really appreciate you guys taking the time to be a part of this conversation and share your thoughts and, and information. Um, you know, again, this is a, a hot topic for sure that a lot of people are thinking about and, and that's that's at top of mind for a lot of people, especially as the situation is developing. I know here in British Columbia, kids are starting to go back to school now. So there's a lot of questions that are coming up and a lot of, you know, close monitoring of the situations. So you know, I think this this information is going to be really useful and really helpful for a lot of people. And uh, I really appreciate you guys uh, taking the time and for everything that you do. Thank you very oh, much for, for having us. us. Great. Thanks again. I hope you enjoyed today's episode of Biba's Rediscovering Play podcast. If you'd like to learn more about some of the research that Dr. Clace and her group have done collecting and summarizing evidence on the filtration properties of cloth masks, check out clothmasks.ca for a plain language summary of their findings. If you'd like to find out more about the Biba Rediscovering Play podcast or check out our other episodes, visit rediscoveringplay.fm or listen on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. As always, thanks so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed it. And thanks for rediscovering play with us.